afternoon and welcome back to our last session of the day. We will begin a special guest panel. We have guests coming from uh, our friends from the East Coast and from uh, Central Ontario. We have uh, Blair Gould here from uh, Mi'kmaq Kinemat Way. She's the executive director of the organization and she will be giving a presentation on the uh, on the education system and their agreement that the Mi'kmaq have set up in their nations. Uh, we also have uh, Tracy O'Donnell. Tracy is a member of the Anishinaabeg uh, education, Anishinaabeg, oh, oh I forgot. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyways, Tracy O'Donnell is here is to present on the Anishinaabeg agreement, along with Helen who works in the fiscal piece of the uh, that agreement. And we also have Lisa, Michan, um, Lisa Michano, who's a member of the board of directors for one of the regional bodies of the Anishinaabeg Agreement. And to help facilitate this presentation, we have uh, Derek Chum, our lead negotiator from NEN. And with that, I will hand it over to Derek. Derek? Uh, thank you, Joss. And uh, well, uh, nice to be back again, Education uh, jurisdic just Jurisdiction Summit participants. Um, so I'm here to host a panel of uh, guests from organizations that have um, th that have experience with jurisdiction. So we want to hear a bit about that. Um, in the earlier presentation, we, um, we heard about uh, their First Nation control systems, including, um, including your organizations and our friends at Finesc in BC. So we, we heard from the uh, MK system out east. We heard about the uh, KEB system in Ontario and Finesque in BC. So we have an idea about how their systems are organized. We're gonna hear a bit more from our participants today. I'm hoping that we can uh, learn more about how uh, your organizations operate, what uh, challenges you face today. And um, we also, of course, wanna hear about your successes. Um, I'll have some questions to guide the discussion today. And we can, of course, also take questions from Summit participants, uh, participants in the uh, comment box on the right side. Please feel free to type in your questions there, and we will relay them to the uh, to our guests here. So, all that said, we're going to get uh, started here with a presentation uh, from Blair Gould, who is uh, will tell us a bit more about the MK system on the East Coast. So, Blair, uh, take it away. Claudio. Well, yeah a presentation here to share. I know um, I, I will be monitoring the questions, I suppose, in the chat box and yeah, feel free to ask. So, um, hello, Delwisi uh, Blair. My name is Blair Gould. I am the executive director for Mi'kmaq Nambadnoi and I reside in the community of Eskasoni. Uh, with me today as well, I, I have an observer and um, of course, free to answer any questions from a governance level and from a chair level I have with me, uh, Dr. Chief Leroy Denny. Um, so we're very happy to be here. Uh, my presentation uh, is intended to be brief, uh, but certainly takes a look at every piece of our governance uh, structure from community level all the way into the board level, highlighting bits and pieces of the organization um, and, and the work that we do as a service delivery organization, as well as um, you know some notable things to spotlight uh, in telling our story over the last 25 years. So it is a very big, um, it's a very big moment for Mi'kmaq and currently, and I'll share a little bit here. We are at 30 years. 30 years ago, um, we're looking back. And in 1992 uh, was when it all started, in 91, 92, uh, around the framework agreement. And all chiefs in Nova Scotia agreed to the, the idea of jurisdiction and taking control over education. I know uh, a lot of things in between then and when the final agreement was negotiated and signed, uh, a lot happened. So through these um, sort of next several years, we are looking back 
and celebrating those histories uh, that have brought us here and really spotlighting the successes that we've uh, been able to deliver with our communities. Uh, of course, you know, um, no stranger to a lot of the great things that I'm sure you've heard. Um, but just very briefly, 1992 uh, was the start of the framework agreement. Um, in 93, we requested the transfer of jurisdiction. 94, uh, 13 chiefs involved in what is now known as the political accord. Uh, 96, working provincially here in Nova Scotia to understand what transfer of jurisdiction means, uh, both federally and provincially. And in 97 was the final agreement uh, signed with nine communities initially. Uh, since then, three more have onboarded. In 1998, this is where uh, more legal um, more legal positions have taken place to ensure um, that the transfer of jurisdiction has completed, uh, as well as giving uh, Mi'kmaq and Amadnoe sort of the, the corporate entity of MK uh, is now in legislation. Bill C-30 is was the, the federal act, also known as the Mi'kmaq Education Act. Uh, Bill number four in Nova Scotia, also known as the Mi'kmaq Education Act, um, sort of worked uh, uh, in parallel and, and, and came to fruition and passed by royal assent in 98, uh, 99, sorry. Um, so it's a, there's a lot of, of, of history there. We serve uh, 12 of the 13 communities here in Nova Scotia. Millbrook is not a member community of MK. However, it is important to always mention uh, their involvement in MK. Governance wise, uh, many of the initiatives that we conduct uh, as an organization, they are included in. So uh, pieces of treaty education, language especially, um, they just have not become a formal uh, member, but they are, they, they are at the table uh, certainly all of the time and very much collaborative when it comes to uh, delivering programs to our communities. Our governance structure, um, I wanted to highlight here, is very unique in the 12 communities that we have. Every community, um, you know, prior and to signing on with MK, uh, needed to join by way of constitution, uh, as well as a BCR and as well as many of the other formal things. Uh, but the constitution really defines how decision making uh, is undertaken in each and every community. Some of those look very different. Some of them have education offices, some of them have school boards, um, you know, um, handling how decisions are made either by way of committee or uh, chief and council that in itself is very different and I'm sure um, a worthwhile presentation just to undertake um, solely and independently. Um, but that's the base of, of how communities came together to say, you know, this is how we assert jurisdiction and this is our definition of what education looks like in our community for our community members. One thing that MK also has ensured, uh, even though we are a service delivery organization, um, we have a common policy document. These are anywhere from building standards to air quality to, uh, you know, teacher policies to operational policies. We have a, a document um, currently actually being revised uh, this year to protect our communities from uh, liability, basically. And what this does is ensure that, you know, we provide a list of policies that the school uh, and community should have. And and that way the community adopts it in their own process and they are able to modify it and reformat it uh, in whatever way they see fit. Uh, but that, that is something that MK provides as, as um, sort of a level one of, of taking on jurisdiction. 
of course, through the Education Act, we have standards for what our curriculum looks like. And the language that's often used there is uh, the provincial curriculum or better. Uh, so Nova Scotia's curriculum or better. And uh, I would dare to argue often out loud uh, that we assert uh, and achieve the or better piece through um, the intimate ways that we are able to support uh, teachers in the classrooms, the, um, the resources that we provide certainly, and the services that we provide and, and really supporting communities to implement the great programs that they do. We have taken on um, creating our own curriculum. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of curriculum being developed right now for high school uh, in around Turkey education that we will publish and that Nova Scotia will adopt. Um, so certainly a lot of really great programming uh, being offered there. Around program and planning, it is very uh, important to, to mention that our, you know, under our regime of, of Mi'kmaq Ganamadnoi, we are guided by a strategic plan that is set and approved by the board of directors uh, as well, you know, with a lot of community involvement from teachers to principals to education directors, um, and of course our, our brilliant staff um, really work hard and together to maintain that MK remains the leader in education, uh, that we continue to set the bar, uh, and that we continue to really uh, make big moves uh, to ensure that our systems uh, are remaining relevant uh, to today's learners, uh, as well as not forgetting our, our important histories of being Mi'kmaq and being an Ono. Our governance structure, uh, internally, I guess at MK, we have a charitable organization. It is the foundation for the advancement of Mi'kmaq education. Uh, this has been, uh, in since uh, the organization, I guess, since its inception in 97, well, 92, um, we created this charitable structure. It is gaining a lot more um, status when it comes to donations. Um, so this is something that we're very excited about, uh, securing long-term investments for our students to benefit from and, uh, this is something that, that certainly is worthwhile. Structures and committees. Uh, I did wanna briefly mention uh, some of the really highlighted um, structures uh, that we have internally with Mi'kmaq Ganamadnoi. Of course, our board of directors who meet regularly um, and the board committees that the board has delegated uh, whether that be under personnel or finance or governance, um, we have structures uh, that's, that report to the board of directors on an ongoing and re regular basis. This is where a lot of the information funnels through around making uh, decisions and of course, um, being able to, to act as a support to communities who need it as well. The Education Working Group is a collective of directors of education from every community, and as well as um, post-secondary uh, leads within those communities as well, if they are not the ed education director. We meet together monthly, actually meeting is tomorrow. Um, to, we act as a group that uh, of course, they are. They have a voice at the board of directors. They're able to make recommendations to the board uh, on any topic from finances to programming to operations, uh, as well as uh, we are the central body where we hear a lot of great initiatives um, from partners all around us. And of course, um, inform a lot of the direction that MK is taking. And of course, acting like the support body um, that we are. So we recognize that in these committees that communities first and foremost um, have the jurisdiction and the autonomy to make decisions over education as respective to their constitutions. However, we really come to this table with collective in mind. 
And so leaving no one behind um, is, is a term that we often use and ensuring equitable um, programming initiatives and equitable services to students is always uh, front and center of the work that we do. Uh, subsequently, principals meetings as well. Uh, principals play a big role in our systems. They are uh, the glue that really keeps uh, schools together and they are sort of everything. Uh, I, I can't uh, say enough great things about principals. They have the ear of the director um, to bring them atten to bring attention to um, the details that that need to be brought. But they also have the connection with teachers, with students. So we engage those um, folks monthly as well, and a lot of that is around um, sharing. Uh, best practices, uh, being able to work through challenges, and really functioning similarly to the education working group. Technical tables that have existed at MK uh, are no stranger. We, um, you know, as an organization, we really work collectively with our communities so that we're not doing anything to communities, we're doing it with them. So current tables right now uh, that we have is a common policy table. Uh, capital table, uh, post-secondary, and uh, our Mi'kmaq Nova Scotia agreement table. As a service delivery, of course, MK, um, I wanted to highlight these sectors or, or departments that exist within MK. Um, we have grown um, a lot over the last 10 years, I, I would say, um, when we started out in 91. Uh, there was a, a staff of maybe five or six. Uh, today we're we're toppling over 70, uh, 80. So a lot of uh, really good investments have come our way um, to allow us to grow um, to where we are, not just in the grant, but as well by way of contribution and partnerships that we have, uh, whether it be with the region, the Atlantic, or um, nationally. Academic services, formerly known as FNSSP. We have a lot of supports under this uh, for literacy, numeracy, uh, special education, assessment, wellness is a big um, topic right now for us. And it has been for the last number of years, even pre-pandemic and certainly has, has elevated to uh, being one of the top priorities of the organization since the pandemic. Uh, the wellness of our teachers, the wellness of our students um, is one of the key priorities that we've identified uh, for the last number of years and I think for many years to come. Language and culture, also including Red Road and treaty education. Early learning, sports and active living. And uh, sports and active living is uh, by way of uh, bilateral agreements that we have with the province as well as contributions that we have from Sport for Social Development Canada. The Atlantic Canada's First Nation Help Desk uh, is within the, within the structure of MK. However, they serve the Atlantic, uh, not just MK member communities. Um, they serve um, not just the infrastructure and connectivity and security, uh, but they also deliver telehealth and technology integration. Post-secondary, uh, of course, I, I think anybody would dare to say post-secondary is a beast and certainly we have done a lot um, to really create our own way of, of doing uh, PSE. So we not just focus on secondary, uh, the transition into post-secondary, but we're also working closely with apprenticeship um, and we're now encompassing um, recognition of prior learning and what that looks like and what that means for Mi'kmaq uh, in communities. Our departments typically deliver a lot of PD, um, common resources that will be used uh, in the schools. We make a lot of investment into technology resources, um, you know, from literacy, numeracy, language, uh, you name it. We develop a lot of the programs and initiatives with teachers, with communities, 
um, to deploy. Uh, more notable ones that we have developed were, would be the Ilnoink program, which is the oral language uh, program that we've we started to develop in 2014. Um, we are now about uh, year five or year six of implementation, and this has been one of the greatest programs that we have developed. We've since branched off into the same platform um, to provide uh, numeracy, early numeracy, and that is intended for grades um, two, grade one and two. So there's a lot of great initiatives happening there. Again, programs developed by Mi'kmaq for Mi'kmaq um, are now seen uh, across the country within Mi'kmaq. And of course now taking um, the vision to uh, deploy these more abroad into the United States and hopefully uh, Australia and New Zealand very soon. Uh, so we're very, very proud of that. We uh, create partnerships a lot of the time um, that is what our consultants uh, do, directors do, uh, is create and foster uh, relationships with our partners, uh, not just within Nova Scotia, but, but Atlantic-wide, uh, community-wide, and of course, nationally. I wanted to share a glimpse here of our strategic plan and our, our operational plan. We did this pre-pandemic. Um, we, we started the engagements in 2018. Um, again, asking what MK should be focusing on. So here you see four goals, uh, serving communities, nurturing the spirit of all learners, Dandeli uh, Nuim is a language goal, and reimagining MK for the future. And within that, I think we have about 16 or 15 or 16 objectives, and then, you know, our operational plans to, to deploy them. We are technically in year three of those plans. However, a lot has happened and it would be unfair and a very missed opportunity if we did not ask again, uh, if we did not stop and ask our communities, okay, we've seen a lot uh, and we've been through so much, um, you know, where do we need uh, to pivot or what do we need to highlight and prioritize versus uh, what we set out in 2018, 2019. Uh, this was an exercise, um, I think, the most well-received. Um, we were able to engage virtually in person just because of the nature where we were here in Nova Scotia in regards to COVID. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that um, we have either reaffirmed the things that we knew um, attendance being one of um, the biggest issues uh, for us in a very long time. Um, it, it was not an issue. We have amazing attendance rates. And, you know, over the last two years, just, um, you know, shocked at, at some of, well, not some of, but the reasons and, and the data sets on, on how COVID has impacted our once near perfect score. Um, there's so much more to share from, from a delivery side um, that, you know, would be maybe better answered through questions that you might have. I also really want to highlight uh, the partnership that we have in Nova Scotia. It is a relationship. I, I wouldn't even call it a partnership. Um, we have a Council on Mi'kmaq Education. This is not uh, an MK initiative. This is legislated. This is a legislative committee in Nova Scotia, in which MK is a member of, as well as um, regional centers for education, as they call them now, previously known as school boards. They they have a Mi'kmaq rep uh, from each of those center of educations. We have uh, an MK Nova Scotia MOU. It is beyond a tuition agreement, um, although you know, some may refer to it as that. Um, we define services and individual and shared responsibilities that we have to this agreement, dealing anywhere from curriculum to data sharing, to uh, tuition, to busing, transportation, uh, all of that. And so these are for our enumerated students that MK agrees to pay for. Um, and 
that attend uh, the public systems. So this uh, MOU is up for renewal this year. We are looking to modernize the agreement a little bit, um, just because there is there are no more school boards. A lot of the language has changed since our, our last agreement. MK within the Department of Education or MIGMA within the Department of Education, we have seats at every curriculum table. Anytime curriculum is being revamped, we have a seat at that table. We uh, also have a seat at every committee uh, that exists within the Department of Education. So things like student services, things like assessment. Um, we are regular uh, participants in decisions being made at the Nova Scotia level. We are included at most events. I didn't want to say all events um, because sometimes we, we choose not to participate in some things, uh, but certainly invited to most and, and all. Um, I think also worth mentioning is Nova Scotia does have its own department, uh, Mi'kmaq Services Department, which has an executive director uh, and employees uh, that work within the department, um, you know, anything around Mi'kmaq ways of being and knowing, um, they're there, and uh, MK does have a partnership uh, with those folks as well. Jurisdiction. Uh, I think that uh, this was one of the headings that uh, Derek shared before, um, and we wanted to really hit that jurisdiction looks very different in every community. While we act as a collective uh, in making decisions, those constitutions really detail what jurisdiction um, and, and autonomy looks like in that community. We have recently renewed and sort of updated the MK constitution back in 2019. And just recently uh, a board motion was made in March, 2022 uh, to update community constitutions. Again, um, a lot of these are very old since uh, 97, 96, when, when folks became members of MK and uh, so we want to update and reflect current governance practices, good governance, wise governance in uh, the work that we do and communities do. I think the biggest highlight of, of jurisdiction um, has been recently in COVID-19 operations, um, you know, just doing things very differently from what the province does, um, whether it be uh, closing schools entirely and, and working virtually. Um, I'm very proud of our communities um, when the board made an investment early on in the pandemic. Um, we made a huge investment in technology and our schools were up and running virtually by April, 2020. Um, so students did not miss a whole lot of time um, from, from, from learning and uh, that was as a result of the board um, investment that was made. Uh, additionally, um, there are ways to look at, at jurisdiction and, and, and asserting jurisdiction. Certainly, um, operations is one, school operations is one. Uh, but I wanted to really share a, a school calendar uh, without really giving too much information on, on who the community is. Uh, but they have defined a school calendar for themselves. It doesn't look like your typical uh, September to June calendar. They follow a harvest schedule um, is, is what they call it. Um, and they make time uh, throughout the year from August until July. Um, they are in operation and they take breaks uh, and periods of, of whether it be harvesting time, hunting time, um, you know, they have a very unique calendar when it comes to delivering education. And I think this was, uh, this is the only school that does that, of course, this is the only community that has such uh, a calendar. Uh, but it's really worth mentioning that uh, you can do it differently. We have, uh, of course, as well for jurisdictional support, uh, we have a Mi'kmaq Gunaumadnoi board handbook. It will be available to the public in fall. It just defines a little bit of 
you know, it, it debunks things that we don't wish to see ourselves as, um, that we wish not to or ever be compared to. Um, we refuse to be um, known as a school board. That is not our, our position. That is not our function. We don't tell communities what to do. Um, we don't want to be seen as um, an ISK or something government like um, that says, you know, we're, we're just a, a financial flow through. Um, we have a very big role in education, certainly um, a, a much elevated role. Um, then, then I think we, we often really tell our story about. And so this handbook defines jurisdiction between um, communities and what jurisdiction means. Jurisdiction on a board level, again, as a board member, um, our chiefs accept a lot of responsibility, um, not just fiduciary responsibility, but um, jurisdictional responsibility when it comes to education. So we highlight that. Um, certainly it also um, evolves around how we work with governments and how we work with partners and how we work as well um, in, our, in our biggest realms of um, infrastructure, um, records, things like that. Uh, and it also defines what the executive director is responsible for. And it differentiates um, the role of the board and the role of the executive director so that there's clear uh, communication on what that looks like. So we're very proud of that. It is actually available uh, now. However, uh, it is being translated into Mi'kmaq. That's another big thing for us is Mi'kmaq first. Our board um, holds language and culture in its highest regard. It is in everything that we do. Uh, and I think Dr. Denny uh, chairs a lot of the time in Mi'kmaq, uh, and, and we're very fortunate to be able um, to conduct our business in that way. So Mi'kmaq is, is always first and front and center of everything that we do. I also wanted to mention um, performance measurement and our MKSIS. We have made significant investments in a platform, also known as Datavan, uh, but we've customized it um, to the Mi'kmaq student information system. We collect student information, curriculum, report cards, data tracking, everything that you could possibly want. Um, we make a lot of customizations every single year. Uh, and this is feedback from our teachers, our administrators um, to, make this an, to make this function better uh, for them and, and easily accessible to them. Our responsibility, uh, of course, we are OCAP compliant um, and we hold OCAP standards uh, very high and we are stewards. Um, so communities own their data. Um, we are just stewards and you know we secure and protect it uh, for them. And uh, we're very proud of uh, the, the sort of regime that has been created around um, student information. Um, as well as really hitting home that uh, teachers need data, constant data uh, to inform their instruction. So we've created our own assessments. We've created our own, you know, we, we do our own standardized assessments. We do uh, provincial ones. We do, we do a lot of um, assessment for learning, of learning, uh, you name it. Um, we have developed it through this system. I think it's also worth mentioning here. Um, we have, uh, Dr. Denny and I um, have been advocating for language legislation for many, many years with a lot of different governments. And we successfully advocated in October, 2022, we got commitment that um, the province of Nova Scotia was very interested in co-developing language legislation. This wasn't done overnight, um, kind of leading up to October 2022, or actually October 2021. Um, we did a lot of community engagement. We have a report um, where we went to every single community um, and out of that report, 27 recommendations. That is available, I think, on our website. Um, 
it is it was inclusive of other organizations, other Mi'kmaq organizations. We, um, you know, as MK, we have the mandate for education, but we also have the mandate for revitalizing language and culture, not just in education, but in communities as well. And I think there are a lot of really shared partners. Um, and shared contributors when it comes to Mi'kmaq language. Um, so we wanted to be inclusive of other organizations when we worked on that. The first reading was just last week. Um, it is introduced as bill number 148. It is also known as the Mi'kmaq Language Act in its short title. The second reading is tonight, anywhere between uh, 5 p.m. and 11 p.m. for you. So. I'll be having fun watching YouTube tonight. Uh, they are um, virtual. They are a virtual house just due to the nature of COVID these days here in Nova Scotia. A Mi'kmaq ratification is coming um, in June. And then a joint proclamation of this as law is coming on Treaty Day, uh, October 1st, 2022. I think um, just kind of the ends of my slides here around events and planning. We have an annual planning symposium. Uh, actually, it, it usually takes place in March, but because of COVID this year, we're hosting it in May. Um, there is a lot of really meaningful planning here. This is where communities invite uh, people within their communities to plan. Every community um, has you know, an operational plan, strategic plans. And there's a lot of very interesting um, opportunities to share best practices. It's one of our, our really most favorite events uh, by everyone, not just, not just MK, but by communities as well. Um, and we have that annually. We have a lot of language camps and I'm very happy um, that we are starting them back up this year. Uh, I think it's time. Um, we also share a PD calendar. So this is something that is very critical to um, us as a service delivery and to communities as well. So when I said we collectively plan, we come together and collectively, you know, pan out the school year, um, you know, taking advantage of shutdown days and, and organizing ourselves in, in that way. Um, and we do that every May, June uh, for the following school year. And uh, this is something that has served us very well, organized us very well um, over the last number of years. We just had a trades fair. Um, so I, I thought I would mention that. Um, so a lot of these events are, are kicking back up again, and it's very nice to see. Um, we, we get a lot of really wonderful uh, participation from our communities. And we also host um, annual conferences. So whether that be the Atlantic Native Teachers Education Conference or Onuisotunich, which is a, a language conference, we, um, I, I think for us, the biggest sort of shift in language um, and responsibility is putting responsibility onto everybody for language. It is not the language teacher's job to revitalize language in a school. That is one person out of 800 in some circumstances for us, and it is very unfair. Um, so rather, everybody has a role and everybody has a responsibility to our language and to our culture. And so regardless if you are Mi'kmaq, if you're a non-Mi'kmaq, if you're a speaker or if you're a non-speaker, we support um, teachers in every way, um, support workers, uh, staff in every way um, to promote language and culture first. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And well, I'll be all. I'm sorry. I don't know if I have any questions, Derek. Yeah, well, thank you, Blair. That was very, very interesting. It's great to see how much you've developed over the years and to see the services you provide to your community schools. I think that's an important image for the NAN uh, communities to appreciate, to perhaps see what's possible um, for them too, you know, and because um, this is all new for us. We are, as you know, Blair, early days in our 
in our journey here, but uh, it's good to see how far you guys have gone. And I have to say congratulations as well on the uh, language legislation. I saw that in the news. I think I saw you on Twitter just this morning. So uh, <laughs> congratulations, that's really good to see. Um, well, I'll ask if that we save questions uh, for after the next presentation, if that's okay, Blair. And yeah. um, we're gonna have Tracy O'Donnell uh, present next on the, uh, KEB system and, and their journey. And again, I would ask the uh, Education uh, Summit uh, participants here to uh, think about uh, some of the differences, uh, some of the similarities, and, uh, and what you heard today about NAN's uh, challenges and, and what, you, what you know today of, of where we're going in terms of what uh, our education system uh, may look like. So that said, uh, Tracy, I will turn it over to you for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, I'm going to be doing this presentation together with Helen Barbie-Wash. And so we're gonna share a little bit about the National Bank Education System and uh, our experience uh, through the negotiations and what we have in place right now. So just to give you an overview, uh, our education system is comprised of the First Nations as the lawmakers. They have full control over education and they're responsible for the delivery of education programs and services at the community level. So they operate beyond reserve schools. Uh, they're the signatories to the education service agreements with the uh, local school boards. Uh, but they do come together and on this map here, it shows you our four regional education councils. And these regional education councils for regions one, two, and three are First Nations that are in uh, geographic proximity who work with the same school boards. Uh, so that's how one, two, and three were grouped. And then we have regional education council number four, which is just a collection of the First Nations in our Southeast and Southwest regions. Uh, these First Nations, um, do not deal with the same school, school board because of the number of boards in uh, Southern Ontario, but we just grouped them together um, because that's what we did. And so these First Nation groupings were important for us because it allows the First Nations to come together at a regional level to identify regional education priorities and needs, and then plans to address those needs. These regions also meet together with representatives from the local school boards, the boards that they're working with to address uh, student needs, student priorities, uh, requirements uh, for collaborating to support students. So those regional education councils also bring in the uh, local school boards. And so you can see the names of the communities that are associated with each of these regions. At the regional level, REC number one and number two each have four directors who they select under their own regional process to sit on the central board of directors. Regions three and four each have three directors that they select under their regional process to sit on the board. And the difference in number, we all started out with uh, three directors each, and that was by agreement by all 23 First Nations. But then each of the regions one and two decided for their own purposes that they were going to increase their number of directors. For region one, the increase was attributed to the fact that each of the four First Nations that are part of the region should have a director to sit at the table. And so that's why they have four. When it came to Region 2, Region 2 said, we acknowledge we have three directors, but we want to add a uh, Nishnabem one speaker to our uh, board representation. And so they added a fourth person, and this fourth person must be uh, a speaker. And that was their choice in their region. So I bring this forward just to highlight the fact that the First Nations are the ones who uh, have the authority over the system and the system structures. And if changes are going to happen to the structure, it comes from the community level. It doesn't come from the board of directors. It's the First Nations who make those choices and those decisions. So that's how our board composition has changed in you know, just the short four years that our system has been in existence. And those changes were made by the First Nations coming together and deciding what works best for their own region. And so that's respected. 
So now we have a board of 14 members. And once those 14 members sit together, they are the board of directors for the Kinematsuan Education Body, which is our central uh, coordinating body. And the Kinematsuan Education Body is the recipient of the funds that we receive uh, from the governments of Canada and Ontario. And they are responsible for distributing those funds. They develop a budget and the budget is approved at the board level, and then it's reviewed with the First Nations as well. So there's always accountability and transparency when it comes to the uh, funding for the system. There is a, uh, a number of other decisions and responsibilities that the KEP has as well. So the education system standards, the standards that would apply to all of the First Nations are developed as a template at the KEB level and then shared with the First Nations. And then the First Nations make those modifications or those requirements that they need at the local level. They also develop policies and procedures on how the system operates, again, with the approval of the First Nations. So that is just a uh, short description of our system structures. We have a number of benefits that we see in being self-governing in the era of education. And so with this, we see that you know, we're able to update the curriculum and include more uh, culturally appropriate curriculum, more land-based learning, more language learning, uh, because we have full control over education now uh, within our First Nations. And the Government of Canada has no authority whatsoever in our system structures, our laws, our policies. Um, they're, they're really out of it. The only thing that Canada does provide to us is the funding, of course, to operate our system. And the funding that we receive from the Government of Canada is a grant. So the First Nations have the full control over how those monies are spent. So they set up their own education budgets at the community level. The KEB has its own budget, so funding is set aside to uh, govern the system, and that was negotiated as a separate pot of money from the money that is negotiated to support education programs and services. And so we've developed some principles in terms of uh, funding distribution that we adhere to when we get the money, whether it's from the provincial or the federal government, and how that's shared within the system. But I'll let Helen explain more of the benefits. Miigwech, Tracy. So some of the other benefits <clears throat> identified on this slide really are speak to some of the additional financial benefits. Um, Tracy mentioned that the funding is um, provided to the Anishinaabeg education system. And most of the funding really does go towards the participating First Nations because they're the ones responsible for delivering education programs and services to their students and with their families as well. Um, so the one big thing uh, is that there are no changes to the Anishinaabeg education agreement or the funding levels unless it's agreed to by the First Nations. So this gives predictability to the First Nations with their budgets for education. Uh, we do have some uh, annual price and volume adjusters that have been built into the fiscal agreement that we, uh, so that the First Nations um, see if there's any changes in inflation like we have recently within COVID, there's been some, some, some significant inflation um, that we see an increase in the funding from Canada because of that inflation and our funding also is adjusted based on the volume, which is the change in student count. Um, <clears throat> we have a number of different access to access to different federal investments. There's the one main uh, source of funding, which is through the uh, education fiscal transfer agreement. But anytime there are federal investments in education, those in additional investments are also come to the Anishinaabeg education system and to the participating First Nations. And we are able to, we work on building that into the transfer payment, um, preferably as a grant when we're able to, so that the, that additional funding comes to the First Nations. We also have a clause in the agreements for extra, extraordinary circumstances. 
So if there are circumstances that occur that's outside of the control of the First Nations, that impacts the ability of the First Nations to deliver education programs and services, we may request additional funding for under as an extraordinary circumstance. Uh, we saw the pandemic as an extraordinary circumstance and we did actually ask, uh, have the conversation with Canada for additional, to, to seek additional funding for extraordinary circumstances. The big benefit also towards, of course, when it comes to self-government and education in particular, is that uh, or own source revenue is not a factor in determining education transfer payments. Within other comprehensive self-government agreements, there are clauses where um, the funding over time is reduced based on um, other sort other revenue that the First Nation governments are able to generate. For education, um, that is not a factor. That's built right into our agreement. And then uh, we also have new funding investments from the province of Ontario, and that's a commitment that was made by Ontario with the 23 participating First Nations because we approached them as a collective. And we knew that half of our students were attending provincial schools, that they weren't attending schools on First Nations. So we uh, were able to negotiate additional funding from the province of Ontario to support student success and well being for students attending provincial schools, but also students attending the First Nations schools. And then we have some uh, challenges with the AES. Uh, everybody does, and we learn from the challenges as time goes on. Uh, the big challenge really was related to the fact that we have 23 First Nations participating under, under the Anishinaabek Nation Education Agreement. So that's a large number of First Nations uh, working together. But the great thing is that is also a success of ours is that we were able to have 23 First Nations working together it just takes more time um, to bring the 23 First Nations together and to get to gain agreement on any important issues. So there are some challenges in making decisions on the education governance funding allocations uh, because we do the first, the allocations really do go to the 23 First Nations. Um, we also have some challenges in identifying educational priorities and how to address those priorities. Every First Nation has their own unique priorities that they've determined within their own governing body, but there are also priorities that end up becoming um, priorities for the overall education system because they're common among the 23 First Nations. So it takes some time really to identify some of those priorities and um, to address them as well. We did uh, create system structures to reflect and respect the First Nation jurisdiction. And that was one of the reasons why the system was set up with four regional education councils. And then the other big challenge, which is, um, I think, always a challenge when it comes to uh, negotiating with the federal government, is the uh, ability to secure funding that's sufficient to implement the vision of the Anishinaabek education system. It was definitely a challenge um, because we're spread out geographically and there's significant travel costs uh, um, involved in going to the different communities. The communities in the North have higher operating costs just because of transportation and the distances from geograph from the urban centers. Uh, so funding is always, has always been a challenge and I think will continue to be a challenge just because we are working with the federal government and Ontario governments, but it's something that we're We've just been working with and working with the uh, both governments to try to address some of the shortfalls. So we have uh, just in the past uh, two years actually developed a new strategic plan. So we worked with the participating First Nations to uh, revisit our vision and our mission and our strategic goals. And um, this work was done, unfortunately, during the pandemic. And so all of our consultations ended up being online. We had virtual consultations, which created some challenges in and of itself um, to gather people. But 
it was also successful on the other hand because we had a lot more people attending the meetings because travel wasn't involved so it was less costly that way uh, to bring uh, more people together and so we have a new uh, vision statement and uh, mission statement that were developed that are to guide us uh, for the next five to ten years and we also uh, during that process identified uh, four goals that we're working towards. So the main goals each have a number of objectives that are associated with them and the staff and the board each develop an implementation plan to say how they're going to work with the First Nations to achieve these goals. So our first goal relates to uh, supporting Anishinaabe student success in Bimatsuin and that's our direct service delivery. We also want to focus on incorporating Anishinaabe Otsawin, Anishinaabe Bematsawin, Anishinaabe Mwen, and the Godwanagas Anishinaabe into uh, our system. We want to enhance our existing partnerships and also develop some new partnerships to develop our educational goals and also enhance our organizational effectiveness. As you can see, just from the um, discussion uh, that I had or the information I shared about our system structure is that uh, we're only four years old as an organization, so we're still learning and growing. And so we think it's time to, to start looking at the effectiveness of the structures we have in place. When we started our negotiations, and even now, uh, we maintain what we call a double bilateral approach to education. So we negotiated one self-government agreement with the government of Canada, and then we negotiated a separate master education agreement with the province of Ontario. At the time of our negotiations, the province of Ontario didn't have a negotiations mandate or any policy on uh, Indigenous self-government. Uh, so that's not a place that they were willing to go. So. We, we figure it's, we don't need Ontario's recognition of our jurisdiction because it's inherent. We have that jurisdiction. So let's negotiate this practical arrangement with Ontario. 8% um, of Anishinaabek students uh, go to our on-reserve schools, which leaves 92% of our students going to provincial schools. They either live off-reserve and go to the off-reserve schools or live on-reserve and go to the off-reserve schools. So knowing the significant number of our students are in an education system managed by another government, we needed an agreement with them to determine how they were going to collaborate with us on supporting student success and well being. And even though we had these bilateral, these parallel processes going on in negotiations, we continued uh, what we call double bilateral meetings. We would bring Nishnabe, Ontario, and federal representatives together at regular meetings, at least on a quarterly basis, to share information on the negotiations that are being uh, had and the agreements that are being reached and the processes or the plans for moving forward. So in our agreement with Canada, we got the mandate from the uh, chiefs to move forward. And we um, initially negotiated for jurisdiction over education from junior kindergarten to grade 12. And most recently, the chiefs uh, in our last annual meeting last year decided that we need to expand that and we need to negotiate for funding from Canada to cover early learning and childcare and adult education as well. So we're adding that. We also have post-secondary funding included in our arrangement. And we negotiated with Canada our education agreement, a fiscal transfer agreement and um, education implementation plan. I'll let uh, Helen review the uh, provisions of our fiscal transfer agreement. So for the um, self-government funding that's provided for the Anishinaabe education system, we have an education fiscal transfer agreement. It's a five-year contract that replaced the funding that was previously received by the 23 participating First Nations that they had directly received prior to implementation of our agreement. So that was prior to April 1st, 2018. Uh, the funding I mentioned earlier that there are price and volume adjusters that's provided, um, so we are subject to that those adjusters uh, and then the First Nations are eligible for any general funding increases in education that has been provided by Canada. And we actually have received uh, quite a few funding increases for the JK to grade 12 um, there's two different increases that we've received. For the COVID funding that was provided by the federal government, we received additional funding for uh, to support post-secondary students, but also for the safe return to school funding. 
Uh, we're also uh, receiving before, before and after school program funding as a result of the budget 2021. So, any, so we do keep an eye on any federal investments in education and then have the conversation with Canada about accessing funding for the 23 First Nations. And so this contract is five years, uh, which we started April 1st, 2018. And our five-year contract is up March 31st, 2023. So we're actually in negotiations right now for our, our next fiscal transfer agreement. And I mentioned earlier that we definitely feel like that we didn't receive sufficient funding to for the actual structure that was set up and for the delivery of education programs and services. And we're using the negotiations for the next fiscal agreement to uh, gain additional funding for to meet the needs within the 23 First Nations. And just to highlight that the needs are great. Um, in the proposed um, human resources requirements that we are preparing for the Government of Canada, we have over 112 new positions that we'd like to introduce into the system to meet both the requirements to add or enhance the support that's available to students, but also uh, the in the governance component to make sure that we have all the positions that we need to operate our system at its highest uh, capacity. And with the government of Ontario, as I said, we have a separate agreement and we looked at this separate agreement uh, in terms of securing additional funding. When we went into the negotiations with Canada, we knew that the federal government would never provide all of the funding that's required to support the Anishinaabek education system. We also knew that a large number of our students, 92%, are attending the provincial school system. So we said we need an agreement with the province of Ontario, not only to collaborate and work together, but also for them to fund education. So the province of Ontario makes an investment through a transfer payment agreement into our system into which we uh, have a number of joint initiatives. Um, we operate what's called the Nagan Kajami Fund, which is an annual proposal based fund where First Nations can submit proposals for projects as individuals, as groups of First Nations, or in partnership with uh, local school boards uh, for whatever they believe would be most valuable to support students. And then there's funding provided for these uh, projects. And from these projects, we hope to develop system-wide uh, changes. And so we have a strategic initiatives fund that the province of Ontario also invests in to, uh, again, support students. And that one of them is the uh, graduation coach program, the Learning As We Go, which is an annual uh, review um, process to determine uh, it, what we can do better within our school system. And we have the Nishnagegi, which is the student uh, measurement on how students are doing, looking at their emotional, physical, spiritual um, well-being, not just the, not the academic side. So we have a number of important initiatives that are funded by the province of Ontario. And this master education agreement actually creates a partnership where we work together to get the uh, school boards and the First Nations to a place where they're partnering to better education. And we have a multi-year action plan that sets out all of the projects. I believe there's 14 projects in this latest plan that we focused on working together with Ontario and the funding that goes along with it. Another important element that we negotiated was the data and information sharing agreement. So we have an agreement with the province of Ontario that gives us access to student information for those students who are attending the provincial schools. So our First Nations uh, collect the consents from the parents, guardians, or the students themselves, and we share, we let the government of Ontario know that we have these consents, and then they can pull the information out of the Ontario Student Information Management System to share with the First Nations. And when we negotiated this agreement, we negotiated that data and information sharing agreement so we could create a new database, the Anishinaabek Education System Student Information Management Database. And we can include in there the information that we've gathered from the uh, students who are attending our on-reserve schools. And that would allow the Anishinaabek Education System to see trends over time, to uh, look at student achievement and decide you know, where investments should be made. 
And it also allows for us to identify goals and priorities for what the school boards should be paying attention to, uh, because the government of Ontario doesn't have access to say, okay, these are the Anishinaabek students, and we can tell you exactly how your students are doing, just generally. Uh, so we created this data and information sharing agreement that allows for us to draw that information out of the provincial system. We were also successful in negotiating um, a zero suppression. So the government of Ontario doesn't withhold any information, even if it's for one student in one grade, that information is available to the First Nation. And our argument was it's the First Nation's information. It's a requirement for us to support our students. And so that information needs to be shared. Uh, so there's some good things that came from that master education agreement. So some of our successes are, of course, we have 23 First Nations all working together. We did support from other First Nations across Canada. And I want to acknowledge because they did uh, meet with us when we requested to share information about their experiences, their challenges, and how they overcome issues. We also worked with the uh, First Nations in British Columbia through the First Nations Education Steering Committee. We, our federal legislation was enacted and we became effective on April 1st. The fact that we were also able to secure an agreement with the province of Ontario and secure additional resources in education was also very exciting for us because generally the province draws a line at the reserve uh, border and says, okay, on this side of the line, it's federal responsibility. On the other side, that's our responsibility. But we were successful in getting Ontario to actually invest funding into First Nation education on reserve but it wasn't all easy. We had uh, evolving federal policies that we had to deal with. They were always changing through the years of negotiations, changing negotiators. They would, new negotiator would come in and want to rewrite what we had already written to match their style or their approach. Uh, we didn't have enough funding to do the consultations that we wanted to do. We had 23 First Nations spread out over a large geography. We have two remote communities that are available only by ferry uh, during part of the year. Uh, so we had a lot of challenges in terms of making sure we could reach all the people all the time. But we created an education working group where we brought together representatives from all of the Anishinaabek First Nations to come together. And then we always made the effort to head out to the communities to uh, hear directly from them and work with them to make sure the agreement reflected their needs and requirements. The federal and internal decision-making processes are long. It takes a long time for the government to agree to positions or to secure mandates. It was always an ongoing challenge to get decisions made in a timely way. And our negotiations span the course of over 20 years. And it was a result of those issues that I just raised. And to keep the Anishinaabek First Nations engaged over that period of 20 years uh, took some effort, but education is important. So everyone uh, stuck with us uh, through that process. So Tracy mentioned that we are, um, you know, we're now in actually year four of self-government for education for the Anishinaabek education system. So we've learned some lessons, you know, when they, the, um, what we, some of the things that we thought would happen when the planning for the AES uh, was different than what actually happened. So we wanted to share some of the lessons that we learned uh, within the, within the negotiations. What was really important to the AES was to bring the citizens along through the negotiations to, to have prepare for a successful ratification. Uh, negotiating meetings with Canada were actually held within the First Nations and the community members were invited to come and join the meetings to hear from themselves uh, how the negotiations were going on. Um, and information was shared regularly with the First Nations uh, that were looking at ratifying the education agreement. We also secured guiding principles and advanced the negotiations. And the big thing was uh, never to never lose sight of the end goal because Tracy mentioned it took 20 years and um, that was the mandate was given by the chiefs. And that was always something that really um, was important um, to the negotiators. We also needed to be clear and consistent in our negotiations position and our approach. And that was to ensure that the information that was 
um, heard and received at the community level that that was always consistent and that, and that they, um, when they came along and heard any of the information in the negotiations, it was always the same and we clearly articulate, articulated uh, the information um, that we were able to share. And then the big one, use all the tools at your disposal to advance your position. Um, there's the negotiations. There was also political advocacy and lobbying required. We had to do some public communications as well as private communications. And that was actually very important when it came to passing the legislation. Um, and, and I think it was like 120 days, I think you said earlier, Tracy. So it's actually, it's considered a short time apparently when it comes to passing legislation. <clears throat> so we definitely need to use all the tools that available. And then we also have some other lessons learned when it came, comes to the fiscal agreement and that's on the next slide. So we, uh, what we learned was that we need to negotiate fiscal agreements to match the fiscal year that it was already in place for the federal agreements, but our, our agreement with the province actually matched the school year uh, because most school year funding provincially is based on the school, uh, the school. so for September to June, uh, but it made it more difficult uh, to budget and to manage the budgets for the provincial funding because it didn't match the fiscal year. So it, it meant more work involved in managing the budgets. Uh, to, so take time negotiating the budgets and the payment schedules um, towards the end, particularly with the Ontario um, fiscal agreement, because we were trying to get that uh, everything in place for April 1st, 2018. Um, we did, I think, in the last couple of months, um, put a lot of effort into negotiating the budgets and the payment schedules. Um, and you know, we all know in our communities that people like to take their time and we might want to be able to understand everything before decisions are made. And at the time we, um, it didn't, it felt like it was rushed. We still achieved what was, what was um, we needed. Uh, and we're actually now in the second fiscal agreement with Ontario. And then lastly, also negotiate options and processes to secure additional funding support. And that's something that we are still dealing with. Um, we do have the options to include additional federal investments in the, um, for the 23 First Nations, but the process to secure the funding is never as clear as you think it's going to be, even though we do have an agreement that there is that ability to access additional funding, general funding increases. It takes significantly longer still because of the federal government processes in place to get that actual cash in the bank account to be able to transfer it to the First Nations. So some of the opportunities that we've been able to realize because we are self-governing is that we've been able to focus attention and we have resources now to uh, develop things that, that will support our system operations. So we have a cultural competency program that we're implementing in uh, partnership with the First Nations, where the First Nations are delivering this programming to school board staff and the school board staff are coming into the communities for this training. And that really supports relationship building. On our website, at the um, AES website, we have a wellness portal which uh, provides information to all of our First Nations for all of the uh, health uh, and social services and other supports that are available. And you can use that portal by looking at geography, like what, where, where you're living, and it'll tell you all the services that are available there. And it's continually being updated uh, all the time. It's something that uh, is very uh, interactive and that's useful for uh, parents or educators who are looking support for supports for students that they can just go to this one place and find everything that they're looking for. We also have a special education guideline that was developed uh, for the First Nations, a student transition protocol that's been shared with the boards as well for students transitioning between our two education systems or even transitioning from elementary into high school, uh, like grade level transitions. So that transition protocol also supports collaboration to make sure that the transition is student focused and meeting the needs of the students. 
We also have education services guidelines that were put together to provide First Nations and boards with information on what should be included in an education service agreement and the uh, viewpoint that that agreement should be written. So it's not a, just a financial transaction where tuition is charged for a certain number of students, but it's actually looking more at what types of services and supports are available to those students and how would a First Nation and the school board collaborate to ensure that the students are succeeding. Uh, we've done an education major capital needs assessment to look at our, our school replacement, um, adding on to our existing schools. We have uh, dedicated funding to support the operation of our system, so nothing is taken from our education program and service side. And we have regional collaboration and information sharing. We have an annual forum with the Ministry of Education, the First Nations and school boards that work with our First Nations called the Nikon Kajami Forum. We have a regional um, fall and spring meetings where the First Nations get together to address regional issues, but they also meet on one day with the school board. So that gives an opportunity for uh, working together. We also make sure that youth are engaged in our system at our Nigong Kishalmi Forum every year. The youth from our regions come together and the youth develop educational priorities that they present to the Ministry of Education, the school boards in the First Nations uh, themselves and the KEB to say, this is what we need to see. Uh, this would help us uh, as students. And they present those priorities each year. And then those priorities are taken to the regions and the school boards in the First Nations collaborate and decide how are they going to action or respond to the student needs, the needs the students identify to them. And then the next year at the forum, the boards and the um, First Nations uh, report on what they did with those priorities. So there's some accountability back to the students. And we have that ongoing cycle of students providing information and then hearing back to what has been done. Uh, so there's some accountability built in there right uh, to our students. Um, and that's it. Nishnabe Kanamatu and Mongo and Nishnabe Pane. So if we're teaching people to be Nishnabe, then we'll have Nishnabe forever. So our student. Uh, or our education system is about uh, ensuring that there will be Nishnabek forever. Miigwech. All right. Well, thank you, Tracy, and thank you, Helen. That was very, very informative. Uh, again, uh, a lot of work uh, obviously has been done over the last few years by your organization. Um, interesting to see some of the challenges that, uh, you know, NAN, NAN will have on the horizon. You've kind of been through already. Uh, thinking about the, some of the remote communities you deal with. As you know, uh, NAN has a number of remote communities uh, within its uh, territory. It's got a large footprint. And uh, likewise, with, with you guys, your organization has a large footprint. And it's interesting to see how your, um, how your governing uh, structure responded to that large footprint in terms of breaking it down into four regions. Um, you know, these are questions in front of NAN right now in terms of uh, what does our governance structure look like and, and uh, you know, certainly perhaps some lessons that we can, we can learn from the work you guys have done. Um, I'm going to get to some questions that have been building up here in, in the uh, chat box. So uh, I believe this uh, first one goes back to Blair's presentation. It was posted uh, while she was chatting. Uh, and it says here, you mentioned school attendance uh, as an issue, Blair. And was that uh, only during COVID or is that a, an ongoing struggle? And, and, and I'll have a follow up on that about um, student achievement generally, um, you know, under the system and Tracy for you, Helen, you guys too, and, and uh, Lisa, student achievement, has it gotten better with the implementation of your system? Anyway, we'll start with Blair. Thanks, Derek. Our average attendance rate uh, within our MK schools is 91%. And so this is a very much a COVID issue with attendance now being very um, at the thresholds of being low, you know, between 70 and 80% for us is considered low. Um, different communities approach attendance um, differently. Some incentivize it, some uh, you know, really have really great policies and procedures when it comes to education um, attendance. Um, so for us, um, certainly COVID um, is the number one factor in our 2020 attendance um, and as well as our 2021 attendance. 
Helen, Trace, are you seeing the same things at, in your schools and with your students? I would invite Lisa to uh, answer that working directly in the conversation. Hi, Lisa. Thanks, Tracy. Hi. Um, so here in Bitagon Anishinaabeg, um, because the AES is, is in a very early stage of setting up baseline data and systems that will start tracking those as a system collectively, um, each individual community is still tracking. Um, in our community, particularly, um, I do a lot of the tracking and attendance rates aren't really a core issue anymore. Um, I also track graduation rates, which in our community for the last five years have been over 80% with a high school graduation uh, diploma. That's what our students are graduating with. Um, they also transition into the local community school where there's uh, it's a public school with a school board. We have an ESA and uh, there's a lot of uh, communication. There's a lot of initiatives um, that have us heavily involved in what's delivered to our students at that level, even though we're not actually delivering services. So the, the nice thing about being a part of the AES system is that there's, there's no longer the sense of control that um, the government once had on us in, in, in delivering our locally based curriculum. We, we ta we've taken our, our curriculum in the, in the community school and we've only kept the Ontario language arts and math curriculum and we've totally changed it. We have different objectives. We have incorporated um, community language, land use, um, and ceremonies within our uh, our system itself, and really, it, it's really assisted in in building identity. Um, actually, right now we're in the middle of our fish harvest, and the school will be going out in its entirety next week to harvest uh, rainbow fish in, our, in, in the northern part of Lake Superior. And that's that's part of the curriculum and it involves community members and parents. So I, I am seeing a positive, even though, um, you know, the, 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 collective, um, the collective approach to gathering data isn't quite set in place yet. Um, I do it myself within the community. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Lisa. Um, Blair, just back to that question about um, success over the course of uh, the system. Have you seen student outcomes, uh, their achievement improve in that time? Absolutely. So we have um, a consistent 94% graduation rate um, within our systems. 83% uh, of, of Mi'kmaq students here in Nova Scotia are in our systems within MK. Um, so we have, you know, a lot of achievements as well to, to note around literacy and numeracy significantly in, enhanced over the last 25 years. Um, a lot of that is sort of referred to gap, gap closure. Um, you know, a lot of the reports that the province has written certainly um, kind of tailored to that. But we take really great pride in developing our own assessments as well. And I think for us, creating those baselines developed by Mi'kmaq for Mi'kmaq is number one priority for us and defining what success looks like for each individual child um, from a Mi'kmaq perspective um, has been one of the greatest achievements for us over the last 25 years. Um, so very proud of that. And uh, I think for us, uh, you know, in, in turn of, of our graduation rate, we have over 800, um, 800 students in our PSE systems. Um, so currently enrolled in, in post-secondary and anywhere between 150 and 200 graduates um, a year. So very proud of that. Awesome, okay, that's good to hear, good to hear. I wanna come back to the, uh, the, the land-based uh, issue or question in a second, uh, Lisa, but uh, I wanna to go to a, another question here from the participants. Um, so the question is, with respect to teachers, what are the plans for teacher training as a source for human resources needed to meet the needs of this system? Will there be need for teacher colleges to change their curriculum to meet the needs of First Nations schools? 
uh, the needs of the education system being put in place or in existence. How, I guess is, is the education system responding to what uh, your education systems are bringing forward in terms of bringing teachers on, on, uh, on board? Yeah, for us, I think um, partnerships and relationships with institutions have really benefited us. Um, we have, you know, I think worth mentioning is a is a partnership with St. Francis Xavier University, um, notably their education um, sectors, and we have developed teachers over the years. So it was a priority identified 25 years ago that we didn't have enough Nigma uh, teachers. And our solution was, well, let's create them. And uh, through cohorts and through programs, um, we designed uh, these programs for ourselves uh, and developed in community models. So whether it be to employed individuals uh, and needing to take cohorts on weekends and trying to, trying to just cram uh, two, three year programs in, you know, in a very isolated time period. Uh, in one community, we have, 90% uh, of their workforce is MIGMA, right? So very, very proud of that. Um, and we don't have enough teachers, right? Surprisingly, those efforts made 25 years ago, we're now seeing a high flux of teachers retiring and moving on into the next part of their journey. And um, so we need to create more teachers. Uh, so this is a ongoing efforts all the time to create um, not just education teachers, but we co-develop and co-create um, master's content, you know, so higher learning can be achieved by our community members, cohorts there to be really um, centralized um, and that meet our needs. Um, so we are very loud when it comes to advocacy. And, you know, if we knock on a university's door and there's no appetite there, we move on. <laughs> it's mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. simple. So, um, we are very much grateful for the partnerships that we do have. Thanks. It, it, are we seeing that in Ontario, AES folks? Are we seeing similar things with universities stepping up to graduate more Indigenous teachers? And it's something that we've put into our strategic plan. Uh, during the negotiations phase, we did have contact with the um, teachers' colleges here in the province of Ontario to initiate discussions with respect to our opportunity to collaborate. We want to enhance the curriculum within the uh, teachers' colleges and require or include a requirement that those graduating teachers have um, a certain number of courses that are specific to uh, Indigenous, whether it be Indigenous language, Indigenous history, like this, something has to be part of their uh, qualifications. And so, uh, one of our strategic goals is to pick up some of that work and develop partnerships to make sure those programs are in place. If we look at it on the flip side, when we do have, um, we do get, and this is just reality, uh, new teachers coming to the school who are not familiar with uh, First Nations and First Nations realities. So one of the communities is developing um, like a base course that every teacher who comes into their community is required to take as part of their condition of employment. So they learn the history of the community, they commit to uh, language learning, uh, so that the teachers are better qualified and uh, have a more, um, a better understanding of the community that they're working in, and the history of that community. So we're developing on our end as well within our system, uh, supports for when we do bring in teachers into our community, so they're familiar uh, with the, the school and how it operates, and even familiar with our education system. It's one, it's the fact that we're running a separate publicly funded education system here in Ontario is often lost on some of these teachers when they come to work in our system and they start talking about the, this union and that union and the Education Act says this, that doesn't apply. We're, we're running our own system. And so there's that education uh, that has to be done. So that's something else that we're working on as well. Okay, so thanks for that. Thanks for that. Um, there's a question about, to, oh, sorry. Sorry. I just wanted to comment that informally, our community, um, we because of the flexibility in funding and we determine where our professional development um, um, is prioritized, um, our community, engaged in partnership with Lakehead University 
and we were able to uh, fund and develop a program at a gra graduate level for all the teachers. And actually today is the last day of their course. They've graduated with a master of education degree in land-based learning. So that mm -hmm. has been able, that has built capacity within, within the uh, First Nation uh, with having the flexibility of funding through the AES system. Okay, so that I wanted to ask about that, the land-based learning and uh, language learning. So you talk about flexibility of funding. So you can use the funding however you wish, right? Is, did these programs for land-based learning and so forth, the language learning, did you receive extra funding on top of regular programming or is this a reallocation of what's given to you, spent according to your priorities? The government wants to go first. only provided us with the funding that was available under their existing programs and services at the time. We pushed for additional funding for um, language um, and uh, language, culture, history, like all of those things we wanted to make sure that were part of our system. Our argument was that in the province of Ontario, the uh, I mean, the French school boards receive more funding from the province of Ontario, and that accounts for the difference is because of the preservation and promotion of the French language. So we are going with Canada that we should be entitled to that as well. If we're talking about comparable funding, then let's be real. Uh, but that's not where the federal government at the time was ready to go. So in our renewal, we're again pushing for the same uh, requirement for additional funding. Now we're framing it as uh, a way to uh, redress uh, the wrongs that were done and the legacy of the residential school system, but we're still focusing on the additional requirements for uh, culture and language learning, the um, updating of our curriculum for more land-based uh, programming. Uh, so we're still pushing for that. We've submitted uh, and are requesting funding under the new Federal uh, Languages Act, Indigenous Languages Act as well. So, you know, there's bits of money coming in, but it's not all that we require, and we continue to advocate for that. Okay, thank you. And, and Blair, you've obviously made uh, great strides uh, in language in your part of the world. Um, you know, that I'm sure wasn't always the case. Did, did you always receive funding for language or was that a matter of allocating amongst your priorities? It's a matter of allocating amongst our priorities first and foremost. Um, in different investments have come, you know, through the agreement. Uh, you may have seen the 1500 per child. Um, it's not enough, right? It's, it's almost insulting. Um, that it's, it doesn't compare to what the real and true nature of the cost is. Um, we run, you know, sole immersion schools and we use existing funding. Um, well, that community uses existing funding to operate that. I think through indigenous, um, through the indigenous legislation, um, we have negotiated a, a third party delivery model with Canadian Heritage. Again, it's not something that is the end goal, but it is where we are today um, in terms of accessing more of those investments. Um, but right now we just really um, deliver that back into communities and reinvest into communities who are offering programming for language learning, not necessarily just schools. Great. Thanks for that, Blair. Um, we've got a question from someone here in the group about uh, sharing the presentations. Is that something you know, if our friends would like to do? <laughs> Tracy, Blair? Oh, oh. Yeah, we sent it in already. Okay, so we'll 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 go ahead and share with the with the participants then at our end here. Um, I've got a there's a reference here in the questions to the poll question. I'm not sure what that means, Jocelyn. Is that something we can we should be addressing here? I think it was one of the questions that were uh, that we had posed, and I think so, it has to do with um, 
I'm sorry, I'm not in the the platform right now. Uh, okay, I'm in, okay. In with us here in the Zoom, so. Okay. Okay, let's let's move on to the next question here. How does the uh, regional board enforce the adherence to the standardized curriculum guidelines in community schools? So, uh, take it that would apply to Blair, perhaps um, to AES to some extent. Yeah. So again, it's all content of outcomes or indicators, whatever current language we're using right now in Nova Scotia, um, when it comes to standards that is inputted in our student information system. So every um, child is matched with the, you know, the grade specific uh, outcomes or indicators, and, and that is reported by way of the report card. And that also structures uh, the teacher's lesson plans, um, long range plans, things like that are, that are all done um, digitally on that MKSIS. So it tracks with the curriculum and the outcomes that you're looking for uh, for the students. Okay, I take it it's the same with for AES uh, for the community schools in terms of uh, following standards locally. Yeah, the way our system operates is that each First Nation um, is responsible for the delivery of education. So the decisions with respect to standards are at the community level. So, uh, you know, Lisa, uh, she can talk about the operation of her school, like on, on reserve, but each First Nation does that direct delivery. And the standards that are being developed, um, those standards are, you know, the base, the minimum that would exist throughout the system, but that was developed in consultation with the schools and the First Nations. So it wouldn't vary from uh, what the communities require. Lisa, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Um, just that, you know, when there are system-wide standards that we, we agreed upon as communities and as board, um, you know, we, we took that approach, but really it comes down to what each community, um, their responsibility and their jurisdiction. They, they, they determine which tests they'll use, which benchmarks they'll, um, they'll reach for. Um, the biggest part of that is that there's networking around it within the 23 communities. And if one community says, you know, we're using this as a benchmark or this assessment and another community needs help in it, or, you know, they're using another one, there's always that, that, that uh, platform for networking. Um, but ultimately it is the decision up to the, it leaves the decision up to the communities, what they want to use, what they want to set as benchmarks and what they determine as success. I like, thank you, Lisa. I like that reference to the networking. Um, it, it seems to me that the, uh, both for MK and uh, AES, that the, that what you've built would create uh, and improve networking opportunities, I trust, between schools and uh, educators and so on. So I think that's something that's very important for NAN communities to understand that, uh, you know, this can help you uh, move out of your silo and, and you know begin to share information and learn from other communities. So a uh, very important point. I um, want to ask a question about uh, an age old problem with it's to do with funding, of course, but uh, in this case with, with capital. Um, and how, how does your fiscal arrangement uh, uh, relate or perhaps not relate uh, to capital? Um, any, any comments you want to share there? And did you want to talk about the capital? So with the Anishinaabeg education system, we were not at the time of the negotiations for the Anishinaabeg Nation Education Agreement, we were unable to include education capital as part of the um, responsibility that the First Nations took on. And uh, something that we were actually at our age, annual general meeting last June with the chiefs, they directed us to seek that education capital uh, within our next uh, fiscal agreement. And it's something that really has been ongoing for 20 years. And every time uh, the negotiators have met with Canada, we asked, so <laughs> can we put capital on the table? And so it's been an ongoing issue uh, we did, we were successful in getting funding to do the needs assessment of the 23 First Nations. So 
We're moving in the direction now to really understand what are the capital needs in the 23 First Nations. Um, it should be noted that we have 13 First Nations of the 23 that operate their own schools. One First Nation actually operates two schools, um, high school and elementary. Um, but we also have 10 First Nations who don't, right? And we have a number of those 10 First Nations who do want to um, set up their own school. And we have, of the 13 First Nations, we have First Nations that want to expand the grade levels that they're, that they're delivering or replace existing schools. So capital is a significant issue for the Anishinaabeg education system. We have one First Nation already moving ahead with expanding their grade levels. And it's, it's definitely uh, challenging us as negotiators to try to get the funding for them to really meet the needs. Uh, because without that ability to um, create your own schools, to build your own schools to meet your needs, you don't have full control over education. So that's something that we are um, definitely uh, going to be going up to bat for within these next fiscal negotiations. Okay. Okay, Blair, any comment on that question with capital? Yeah, we negotiated capital infrastructure into our original agreement. Uh, it was a fixed amount. That amount has not grown um, since the 90s. We have issues with what the allocation looks like versus our needs. Um, I think over the last 25 years, we have um, an excellent track record when it comes to building schools, always building on time and on budget. Um, priorities are defined by the board of directors. Uh, certainly we have a capital plan and strategy around what investments we need um, and that we need to negotiate. Um, we often seek uh, at every single um, bill that we have done uh, additional funding. So additional negotiations uh, need to take place uh, around identifying our priorities. We are uh, about a month or two away from finalizing uh, the next capital plan. We are at the end of our original capital plan and strategy, which is um, the school in Eskasoni. Um, this is the largest community, so it's re requiring the largest investment uh, for us. And uh, you know, defining what priorities come next over the next 30 years. We want to be, um, and there is no, budget or there is no investment currently to be more environmentally um, sustainable and to create more sustainability and to really align ourselves with with those sustainable development goals right we want to be more green we want to be um, more efficient when it comes to protecting our planet and current investments don't don't allow for that so if you want to have you know solar if you want to have this there's a lot of advocacy that that goes around this and so a lot of planning a lot of negotiating um, which is difficult um, and you know much what Helen said it's not a true representation of what self-determination really is um, and we need to really advocate stronger and harder for that um, so for us, um, stay tuned for the next capital plan. I'm sure a lot of that will be released um, definitely by fall, but. Um, looking forward to it. I always learn something when I, uh, when I speak to, uh, to this group. So looking forward to that, Blair. I just want to have, I have one quick question. I want to turn it over to DGC for some uh, remarks, but this is a quick question for the AES group. Uh, in terms of the fiscal agreement, did the regional board access all the educational funds entitled to the 23 schools based on its 2018 contribution funding agreements, the nominal role, and then did it decide how much to disperse the funds to each school? So I guess, how are the funds allocated amongst the schools is the question. I can answer that uh, one. Helen, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Since I'm, uh, I'm the accountant in the room. Um, so the funding was based on the existing funds that the First Nations had received in education prior to self-government. So if they had a school, they already had allocations for the operation of their school. And then, so that was provided to the First Nations um, starting April 1st, 2018 from the Kinemodson education body. 
And then any adjusters that have occurred since then um, has also been provided to the First Nations. Um, so the, um, the board of directors of the KEB always wants to maintain that level of funding within the participating First Nations. They don't want to take away from the First Nations. Um, so really that's where we're at at this point where we are there, they're accessing the same levels of funding that they received prior to a self-government with adjusters. And then any uh, additional funds that were received for K-12 uh, budget investments have been allocated to the 23 participating First Nations as well. And I should, I should let you know that no administration fees come off of the education programs and services funding that's provided for the schools as well as just the First Nations overall. Uh, so that's something that's a key principle within the AES. Um, within the negotiations, we are striving to access additional funding for, Tracy mentioned all of the HR resources that we feel are needed within the system, but also to meet additional needs uh, in the delivery of education. And we're, um, we're at a point now where we're looking at how do we distribute the funding uh, equitably to the 23 First Nations that also meets their unique needs. Um, so we are, um, we have a, cons a consultant who's looking at what are the cost drivers for the education uh, needs within the 23 First Nations. Um, but I think it's gonna be, um, it's been in process since September of 2020, and we still have a long ways to go, I think, because anytime you bring in money, right, it's, we need to have a lot of thought uh, to go into it and we need to have a lot of input from the 23 First Nations. So I think it'll take some time and I know from a board perspective the board definitely wants to see that there's some direction given to them around some of these funding pots that come in that are in addition to the self-government funding because they're wrestling with questions every couple of months over how do we allocate these additional new funding that comes in. So um, it's a work in progress, uh, but definitely it goes back to what was originally funded. And that was um, a decision at the time to stay, to continue with that uh, approach at the time, because we didn't know any better. We didn't know what other alternatives there were. Now that we're, we have a better sense of how things are operating, then we're hoping that there is more information that we can now um, rely on to develop and um, an allocation method based for the Anishinaabek education system, but we're still a little far, a little bit away to getting that finished. Okay. Well, thank, thanks, Helen, for that. And our uh, process, one... Derek, is um, uh, our process is for the longest time since well, its inception, I think, of the agreement, we were nominal role based. Um, we rebased our budgets in 2015 um, and have adjusted price and volume since then. Um, again, Creating more protection for communities um, if there was a if there was a loss or gain in volume, um, especially um, if there was a decrease in the volume, that there was protection for them to continue to, you know, run their systems the way that they they have. Um, but something we are exploring again, uh, because there has just been uh, a lot of investments received this year. Um, so. Anytime we do allocate, we allocate in consistent ways. It's either through a base plus, um, it is through nominal roll of the current year and previous year, we, we provide those options. And we always provide a combination year. So past and, and current years. Um, and we provide those um, so that our board can make informed decisions on what the best way to allocate is. Um, so that's just something, a, a good practice that has really worked for us, um, that we were not seeming to be unfair, um, you know, given whatever investment comes down the pike. I can imagine the conversation's going to be pretty tough sometimes uh, <laughs> around that. Okay. Listen, I want to thank you all for, for participating on the panel. Uh, Lisa, Tracy, Helen Blair, thank you. Always informative. Um, before we all go, I just want to turn it over quickly to uh, Deputy Grand Chief here, Bobby Narcisse, who has a few words he'd like to share. Thank you again, uh, right. ladies. Uh, over to you, DGC. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chum. Uh, it's, uh, hello, it's Deputy Grand Chief uh, Bobby Narcisse over here. I'd like to thank the, uh, the panelists uh, this afternoon. 
uh, I, I was catching in and out of a lot of the work that's uh, uh, that you've been doing, all the good work that's been doing, and uh, I think it's very uh, helpful and very insightful as well uh, as uh, as we pursue uh, a, NAND, a really NAND specific education process too, as reflective of the needs of uh, many of our remote communities as well. Uh, you brought up uh, some very good points and uh, uh, points of order too in terms of all the work that. Uh, the progression of work that uh, you, you all have been doing. I really like to uh, uh, thank you uh, for bringing in the um, uh, your expertise and sharing uh, your experience as well, because it's always going to be like best practices and whatnot uh, in terms of uh, all the work that we're doing. And uh, I'd like to like reiterate too, the, the process and the vision that we're, we're going ahead is, uh, is a non-specific one. And we want to ensure that uh, we have high level decision makers there. And I know that uh, you said that we, I, I listened to the fact that, well, this process was like 20 years and all that. And I think our process have been that long as well, but we wanna ensure that uh, there are decision makers. Uh, we met with uh, Minister Haiju and, uh, and, and to, to really ensure that, uh, you know, that the new NAND specific process uh, will encompass uh, a, a, a true nation to nation discussion, uh, but also, um, uh, just really uh, not not fighting for uh, program based or uh, or proposal based initiatives. Uh, we want to uh, move to move the paradigm to look at uh, uh, your needs based, and this is what our communities need, and this is what their communities are developing with respect to language, uh, with respect to their own, their own laws and legislation, and so the work continues. So I really thank you for uh, you, there's a lot of eye opening. Uh, areas that, that we haven't really thought of yet. And thank you for uh, being a part of uh, this panel. And I hope that we could call upon you again uh, to maybe perhaps collaborate and, and get some information off you on uh, on your experience in this regard. But uh, as Deputy Grand Chief with NAN, I thank you for uh, being part of this panel. Miigwech. Thank you, DGC. We'll turn it back over to Jocelyn. Here you go. Thank you, facilitator Derek, uh, our guest panelists, and uh, DGC nurses. That wraps up uh, our panel session. Our last session uh, of the day, we'll be having a closing session at 425. And our last uh, play to win code word is success. So please write it down and enter it during the break. And we'll see you back here at 425 for closing for day one of the summit. See you soon.